Well, hello there, everyone. This is Dr. Leslie Kernison of Better Health While Aging. And welcome to this uh, COVID update for aging adults and their families, in which I'm going to talk about uh, the latest on Omicron, especially BA5, boosters, and more. Today is Thursday, July 21st, 2022. And it's been a little over two months since I've done one of these and things keep evolving. So I thought now would be a good time to um, uh, share an update uh, with those of you who are older or concerned about an older person. And um, so in this update, I am going to talk about uh, where we're at um, uh, with COVID right now, um, what I think the COVID numbers mean and how I think about them, because I think that's um, another thing that has been kind of evolving as we learn to live with COVID. I'm gonna talk about boosters and vaccine updates. I'm going to talk about the precautions that I think are worth taking right now. Uh, I'm going to talk about what you should know if you do catch COVID, uh, especially as regards uh, to Paxlovid rebound. Um, I'll briefly address the question of whether, you know, I think it's worth masking on planes and other frequently asked questions. Um, and so by the end of this, um, I hope to cover um, answers to a lot of questions I'm hearing very often, frequently asked questions, such as, is COVID on the rise again? Is the current variant worse than the previous ones? Do the vaccines still work? Do boosters work? Should I get another booster? Do COVID tests still work? And I think this really comes down to how concerned should I be and what's reasonable um, to do right now? Okay, so um, COVID right now in the US. So I would say that we have been at a high plateau uh, since mid-May. We're currently averaging about 130,000 cases per day, um, but that's the reported number. Um, as I'll discuss when I talk about what the numbers mean, the actual number of cases is estimated, depends who you ask, three to 10 times more. Um, we're also seeing hospitalizations going up to 40,000. Um, deaths are right now at about 426 per day. Our lowest was 260 per day in early June. And uh, so let me share some of the, uh, the data that I look at um, uh, when I look at these numbers. For those of you who'd like to take a look on your own later on, hold on, let me adjust a couple of things on my screen. Um, okay. So uh, this is the New York Times tracker. There are a few others. I forget if this one is available to people who um, aren't um, subscribers or not. But uh, yes, what we can see right here um, is, uh, see, we've had this plateau right here since about May, right? And right here, when we got lower, we never got as low as we were here. And we've been kind of hovering on here. And right now we seem to be on another uptick. And so right now, I don't know whether we're likely to keep going up or whether we're going to stay at this level. And this number looks is lower than this one. However, we were definitely counting more cases at that time than here. And in some parts of the country, the wastewater or other methods of counting cases show that case levels are about as high as they were here. So depends a little bit uh, where you are. And, um, uh, and then if um, you can, of course, use this kind of uh, database to see like where the cases are especially high, because it'll still be different depending on the part of the country or the state that you're in. Uh, and then for hospitalizations, we have them um, right here. And so you can see that um, the levels have been um, of cases have been like this, but the hospitalizations are definitely going up. Now, what's, what's good is that the intensive care unit hospitalizations aren't going up uh, all that much. And then um, for those of you who are interested in nursing homes, I always look at nursing homes. I'm of course, a geriatrician. These are, you know, often our most vulnerable uh, older citizens who are in nursing homes. Um, so you can see here that, you know, nursing homes have, uh, have gone up as well. Uh, this is, let's see, this is May right here. This, um, if you right click on these, it'll show you the table, which is sometimes easier 
uh, to read. So you can see that nursing homes are at about 11,000 cases per week, which uh, is what I was mentioning earlier. And in comparison, during the Omicron surge this winter, we were really at you know 40 to 50,000. Um, so not as much as in the winter time, um, but still uh, more than what we had right here in the spring. And then uh, they have deaths over here. So we, um, and in nursing homes, they make the count per week um, right here. And um, so what do we think is causing this? Uh, well, Omicron BA5, which you probably have heard about. And let's see, this is the CDC variant uh, proportion tracker. And you can see how this is BA5 here that it has just come galloping in. I mean, this is, this is the end of May right here. So two months ago and boom, it's taken over um, the show for right now. Um, and this is actually hypothesized to be one of the reasons why we're seeing this kind of plateau is that we had like a BA2 surge come up and come down and the next, you know, um, surge, this is part of why I didn't even use the word surge on my slide is, you know, the next variant came so quickly that we didn't get a chance to come down from BA2 and we're just right in BA5. And um, so there's this question of whether are we going to have a few waves of COVID every year as a society, or are we gonna have the waves coming so fast that we basically stay at plateaus like this? Still, um, still to be uh, determined. Um, so moving on. Um, now, COVID is also actually surging in um, other countries. So if you ever want to see what is happening in other countries, um, one resource that I like a lot is um, Our World in Data has a COVID explorer where you can, you can look up a country that you might be about to travel to or just for kind of a reference. So here I put in a bunch of European countries because it's summertime and apparently revenge tourism going to Europe is popular uh, right now. So you can see France just had uh, quite a spike fairly, fairly quickly. Um, uh, Italy also, Germany, Portugal had a big spike earlier on. They were the first one of the first countries in Europe to have uh, BA5. And here we are. This is, um, I think, relative to population um, in, uh, in the, the States. Um, so why is this happening? Uh, so the leading hypotheses that I find compelling is um, that BA5 uh, is considered to be very, what we call immune evasive. So it has some extra mutations in the proteins, uh, in the spike. And it's really good at getting around any antibodies that people might have. And people have those antibodies either because they've been vaccinated, that's why we vaccinate people to get them to create the antibodies without actually having had the infection, uh, or they've had COVID in the past. Um, so BA5 is really good at getting around those uh, antibodies that are supposed to prevent infection. Um, now, once people actually are infected, uh, their prior immunity, whether it's due to vaccination or prior COVID, um, does hold up much better against severe um, illness, which is why even though we're seeing a lot of BA5, we're not having as many people in the hospital compared to what we think are the case numbers as in the wintertime. But uh, that's probably driving um, the spike we're seeing right now. And then also, uh, since the spring, a lot of countries have removed COVID mitigation uh, measures that they had before, the um, various types, you know, anything from not requiring indoor masking, not requiring vaccination to enter public spaces and, and things like that. So that's probably why it is happening. So now about these COVID numbers, um, you may have heard, because I've had people tell me this over the last uh, few months, that um, the numbers don't matter, that the case numbers uh, don't matter um, because they're inaccurate or who cares how many cases there are. Um, you may have heard that the uh, hospital numbers um, aren't reliable, um, uh, or maybe you even heard that COVID doesn't matter anymore. So is this true? Well. So about the COVID case counts. Um, so it is true that the reported cases are definitely an underestimate, probably a massive 
underestimate. And that's because many people now are doing COVID tests at home. And uh, in most jurisdictions, those tests, um, uh, you're not required to report it. And there's not even a mechanism really uh, for you to report it to um, your county health department or state health department. So often people are getting tested uh, either if they're sicker or if they wanna confirm it or if they think it might be necessary for their job uh, or insurance purposes. Um, so that's why experts think the true number of tests is more like three to 10 times uh, the numbers that you might see on your county dashboard, state dashboard, or in like a New York Times type uh, dashboard. That said, I think the case counts still matter. So first of all, they're useful for the trend, um, more or less, to see if things are going up, staying around the same, or coming down. Um, and then also, we should remember that um, we have other ways to estimate how much COVID is around. And that's really the point. The point is to understand like, so how much COVID is there around me right now or in our society right now? So that we can, um, uh, as individuals, think about whether it's a good time to take more precautions for ourselves or for somebody vulnerable that we care about. Or as a society, we might think about how to gear up for potentially more people uh, coming in uh, for healthcare or whether to sort of modify policies in other ways. So, um, so I think case counts are useful for the trend, but uh, I want you to know that there are also other ways that you can estimate and answer the question of, is COVID high right now <laughs> around me or in the US or wherever you're thinking about it? And so let me show you um, a few ways that you can do this. Uh, da -da. Hold on. Let's see. I need to reorganize the spacing on my computer a little better next time. Okay. Um, so uh, one is wastewater, which I've mentioned on prior updates. Uh, so a good resource is Biobot. Um, Biobot has wastewater reports from many states and many jurisdictions, not all of them, but um, a lot of them. So this one is, I think, the cumulative one for the US. So you see it um, that not as high as here. Um, they show it by region also. And then you can look up your state. So I might look up California because I'm based in San Francisco. Now, San Francisco, for some reason, is not here. But we can see LA County, where the numbers actually seem to be uh, quite hot, uh, uh, excuse me, quite high, actually. Um, really, they're looking higher than they were in the wintertime. And that can be uh, kind of informative. So one option is to look for wastewater monitoring. And the CDC also now has a wastewater monitoring page that you can check. Um, and then another one to consider is uh, test positivity. Now I'm trying to remember here. So um, the Times does report test positivity uh, over here. And I think if you look up your state, it's probably also available. Um, yeah, right here. Um, but another interesting resource is that Walgreens has made its data um, available. And um, now for Walgreens, the test positivity is really sky high. Now it's funny. I remember back when the public health authorities were saying we should get concerned if test positivity was over 5%. Um, now all of that has moved up um, just because so many more people are doing the testing on their own that the sample who come in for testing, I think have a much higher likelihood of actually having COVID, I think people are more likely to come in for a reported test after they've already possibly had a positive test at home or really had an exposure. But um, yes, you can, um, and again, it's not just the absolute number, it's the trend. And what you see is going up, 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 up. Um, so all signs point to COVID being uh, high right now. And, um, and then in general, you know, another way to ask yourself, so, is there a lot of COVID going on? Should I consider precautions? Is just simply, are people you know catching COVID, right? Um, so uh, for a while now, um, lots of people that I know about have been catching COVID in San Francisco. I feel like we've been at a quite high level for <laughs> over two months. Um, so you can ask yourself something uh, similar. Um, and so, yes, I, I do think, whoops, 
or let's say going the wrong way there. Okay. Uh, I do think these, uh, these things matter. Um, the case counts and keeping an eye on them. Now, what about the COVID hospital numbers? So I've had some people tell me the hospital numbers. I've had some people tell me a few things. Um, so one is that, well, the hospital numbers don't matter that much because so many people in the hospital are there with COVID instead of for COVID. So uh, where does this distinction come from if you're not familiar with it? Um, so hospitals have, uh, many hospitals are now testing everybody who comes in to see if they have COVID. And there are many people who did not come in specifically for severe COVID who are found to have COVID. Now, some of these people, it's really what we call incidental. It's people who are coming in because they were going to have a surgery or a procedure and look, they have COVID. Um, or maybe they come into the emergency room with an accident or an injury. Um, but um, a lot of those people are coming in with a flare up of their chronic illness. Um, their heart failure being worse, their chronic lung disease being worse, their diabetes being worse, and uh, then they're found to have um, COVID. So there's been a debate about um, how do we know which one it is? Um, how do we tell them apart? Um, but I think one can also argue that, you know, does it matter that much? Because overall, most of the hospitalizations of people who have COVID are in older adults, and many of them seem to have their you know, their chronic illness getting worse. And there are reasons to believe that older adults in particular are likely to get tipped over into a flare of their chronic illness if they catch COVID. Even if they're not getting, you know, what we used to think of as like the hospital COVID where people would get the COVID pneumonia and be having trouble um, breathing. So many of these hospitalizations aren't vaccinated older adults, um, but many of them have not had a, um, a booster. Um, and then, of course, there are people who are not vaccinated who are also um, getting hospitalized. So my own take is that um, I don't think it's that useful to really try to parse versus um, parse the uh, with COVID versus uh, for COVID. I think it's interesting when some hospitals, such as UCSF, occasionally reports on their asymptomatic test rate. That can be a reflection of how many people walking around you might have COVID and still be feeling relatively uh, okay. But what's good about the hospital numbers is that they, um, they are less discretionary the way the case counts are, right? People might have COVID and just test at home and it doesn't get reported, but when people are sick enough, they do get hospitalized. So um, I think it does you know, reflect part of the burden of illness that as a society we are experiencing. Um, so I do find COVID hospital numbers uh, useful. Uh, I think it's also helpful to look at the intensive care unit numbers versus the overall hospital numbers. And I wouldn't let that question of, is it with or for COVID distract you? Um, now, another question that I get, uh, or that I was getting six weeks ago, I think I'm getting it less right now, but <laughs> it was, do I need to worry about COVID if hospitalizations haven't yet gone up very much? And I think people were asking that, especially um, you know, six weeks ago when, when the numbers had gone up, but the hospitalizations hadn't yet gone up, I, I had some people uh, ask me that. And so first of all, I think waiting for hospitalizations to go up is a little bit like waiting um, for a house to burn down before you start considering taking fire protection precautions, right? I mean, if there's smoke, you should start paying attention. I don't think you should wait until a house burns down. And um, because once the house burns down, the fire's big. And so likewise, once the hospitalizations have gone up, we have a lot of COVID uh, going around. So, um, so yes, again, I think it's important to follow, you know, whatever decent indication of the numbers you have, even if hospitalizations haven't gone up yet. But I also think of it as, um, don't think worry. I, I would propose think, take precautions, you know? We don't wanna spend our life worrying about COVID, but I think it's reasonable, at least for the next few years, to be prepared to take some precautions when cases are going up or are high. Um, and you wanna remember that hospitalizations generally lag the case counts by a few weeks. And initially when there's a new variant, we may not be sure if it's gonna cause a lot of hospitalizations or not. So this BA5 is causing fewer hospitalizations for the number of cases we think we have than BA1 which is great, but um, we didn't necessarily know that when it first started going up and uh, a few weeks ago. 
Um, so let me now move on to another common thing that I hear, which is, does COVID still matter? I know a lot of people are over COVID, want to be done with COVID, want to enjoy their summer, want to live their life, do not want to be captive to COVID, so on and so forth. Um, and you may have heard it's not a big deal because Omicron is milder, because BA5 isn't causing as many hospitalizations, because being vaccinated means you won't get hospitalized. Um, so um, these are the facts as I understand them. Um, so first of all, it's important to realize that 100,000 people uh, in the United States, at least 100,000 people died during that first Omicron wave in the early part of the year. So um, yes, we had fewer people die relative to the case count than before, but that was still overall a lot of people. Uh, it's true, we are seeing fewer hospitalizations right now for BA5. And this is probably due to um, the immunity levels that we have built up as a society. So first of all, a lot of people at this point have already had COVID and a lot of the weaker, frailer people have died of COVID. Um, and uh, so um, a lot of people now uh, are either vaccinated or have already had COVID or have had both. And even though BA5 is immune evasive and is reinfecting people who had COVID um, this past winter, we're even hearing cases of people who had COVID just four to six weeks ago who are getting reinfected again. Um, having Omicron before does provide some protection. Uh, and that's probably why we're seeing fewer hospitalizations. Um, but older adults and people who are at high risk medically, immune compromised, lots of chronic illnesses, uh, you know, cancer, they are still getting hospitalized, especially those who have not been boosted. And we actually have um, quite a fair number of our uh, older adults who have not yet had a first booster. Um, and even more who haven't had a second booster. So, uh, so yeah, I think COVID does still matter because it tends to disproportionately impact people who are older and more vulnerable medically. And then even if you're not older and more vulnerable medically, catching COVID is disruptive. Um, I know uh, somehow, I think I still have not had COVID, but I know a lot of people who have, they've been sick in bed for a week, they have to miss work, it's disruptive to them being able to take care of their children, take care of their aging parents, um, take care uh, of their work. Um, and then it does come also with the risk of long COVID. And I won't go too much into long COVID uh, today, um, although there is some uh, data, I will share a link to it. Um, there's data out of England that with the Omicron BA1 and BA2, that there were fewer people who were reporting long COVID symptoms. So they said just kind of any persistent COVID symptoms, I think it was at 12 weeks. There were fewer people than with Delta, but it was still something like one in 25, I wanna say. Um, hold on a second. I might even be able to find the... Uh... Here we go. Okay, right here. Um, this is the UK Office of National Statistics. Um, so this is prolonged symptoms from COVID after BA1 or BA2, one in 22 for BA1, one in 24 for BA2 compared to one in 20 for Delta. So, um, you know, to me, that's, that's not uh, trivial in public health, we wouldn't consider that um, trivial. So, so I do think COVID still matters, even though I would love to be done with it. Uh, just as you would. Um, and then lastly, the more COVID transmits among us, the more chances there are for the next more successful variant to emerge. And the more chances there are that we transmit it to someone who is more vulnerable to severe COVID. So I remain in favor of taking uh, what I consider reasonable precautions when case counts are high, like now, and I will talk about what I think those precautions are in a bit. Um, so let's now talk about vaccines and boosters. Um, uh, do vaccines still work? Yes, definitely still work. Despite the evolution of variants, vaccination remains very protective against hospitalization and severe disease. And that's all the more impressive given that the vaccine was developed for you know, the original version of COVID and COVID has evolved so much, um, but it's really mutated more on the outside in terms of its ability to infect us. And uh, the underlying, um, the part of our immune system that fights the more severe 
uh, disease, um, that part still works well against the new variants. Um, so the vaccines work and we have found that vaccine protection wanes, um, especially one, as people get older, um, their immune systems, I think, aren't as robust and they're at higher risk of severe COVID for various reasons. Um, so, um, and then the other thing is the original COVID vaccine were the two doses pretty close together and that's not optimal for setting up the immune system. Um, so it's become really clear that a third dose is really important to boost vaccine efficacy. Um, and it does boost it even against uh, severe disease. Um, and then uh, we've now come into uh, the question of the second booster, also known as the fourth dose. So that also improves vaccine efficacy, um, but the absolute benefit is bigger and more important as people get older or a higher risk, especially if they are over age 80. And uh, so to see, let me see if we can see what that um, looks like, just one moment. Okay, so this is the CDC's COVID data tracker. Loading data. Okay, so right here we can see um, these are deaths um, in people age 50 plus. Um, the black line right here is people who are not vaccinated. This blue line is people who only had the primary series, means the first, uh, well, most older adults got one of the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer or Moderna, that was two shots. So there's the primary series. Um, and then this dark purple line is people who had um, one booster and this light purple line is two boosters. And so if you hover over, you get the actual number. This is the number of deaths per 100,000 population. So you see the biggest difference is really between unvaccinated and vaccinated, right? We have five and a half people per 100,000. Um, among unvaccinated for deaths. Um, I think this was like the, the week ending May 22nd. Um, whereas for vaccinated people, 0 0.92. Um, and you keep seeing a decrease in death rate as you add the boosters, but the uh, incremental benefit is, um, is smaller, although it's more when people are older. And I'll show you some data on that in a moment. Okay, so, um, so this is some additional data on the first versus second booster. This is a study out of uh, Israel on the effectiveness of a second Pfizer booster vaccine. They only use Pfizer in Israel against hospitalization and death from COVID-19 in adults aged over 60 years. So uh, this study took place during the B Omicron BA1 period. And the follow-up, I think, was just 40 days. But uh, I thought it was interesting to see some real numbers. So in their study, among people who were aged 60 to 69, those who had one booster, um, 32 of like 120,000 died. It was basically 0.03%. Um, so a teeny fraction of a percentage point um, uh, died. But those who had two boosters, it was five of about 110,000. So um, that was 0.005% uh, who died. So you see the second booster um, made, a, uh, made a difference. There's the adjusted hazard rate ratio here for those of you who really know your stats. I'm not gonna read those for, for right now. Um, and then among people who are age 70 to 79, those who had one booster, um, the number who died was 51 out of about 75,000 people. So that's 0.07%. Whereas if they had two boosters, it was 22 out of 135,000. So you can see they had a campaign clearly to encourage a second booster among older adults. And that works out to 0.02% who died. And then among people who are age 80 to 100 years, those who had just one booster, 149 out of about 36,000 died. So that was a death rate of 0.4%. So now we're, you know, we're getting to like half a percentage point. So that means one in 200, right? Um, one in 200 of these people who are age 80 uh, over 100 who had just one booster. Now that's still overall 
a very low mortality rate, right? With the one booster. Remember when COVID first came up in Italy of, you know, people who are aged, um, I think 90, 80 or 90 and older, there was a 20% mortality rate, right? So we've gotten it down to, to 0.5. However, um, those who had two boosters, um, there was 65 out of about 82,000 who died. And so that's a mortality rate of 0.08%. So you see that it really makes a difference that second booster. Now, the caveat about the second booster is that that protective effect wanes. We're not sure if it wanes faster with the second booster than the first booster. Uh, they only followed people for 40 days. That's like you know, six weeks. Um, however, uh, certainly during a surge for people who are much older and frailer, it can be worthwhile to, um, to uh, get a second booster. Um, okay, so in short, um, what we know about boosters and VE stands for vaccine efficacy. Uh, so I'd say in general, vaccines work much better at preventing severe disease than at preventing uh, infection. Actually, I will share also just one more, one more study, and I will post a link to it as well. Um, also, if you want to see some actual numbers, this is a CDC report on the effectiveness of two, three, and four uh, COVID doses among people who are immunocompetent and so not immune compromised during BA1 and then BA2, December 2021 to June 2022. And uh, I won't go over all the, the figures here, but this is the part that is kind of interesting right here, table two, and they have it for all ages, but um, they also divide it into 18 to 49 and then over 50. You know, my problem with over 50 is that there's a, there's a huge difference between people who are 55 and 85. Um, so I wish they had broken it out further, but you can get a general sense right here of um, seeing how the vaccine efficacy kind of diminishes as uh, depending on the dose and how long it's been. So for two doses, this is recently between 14 to 150 days or if it's been more than 150 days, so more than five months. So if you wanna get a sense of, as far as we can tell how efficacy wanes, and in this case, they did not measure efficacy against infection. They have uh, ED, emergency department, or UC urgent care. Um, and then um, they show the numbers here against uh, hospitalization. Um, so that can be a good resource too for those who like to parse the numbers and wanna get a better uh, feeling for this. Um, so uh, yeah, so vaccines in general uh, will work better at preventing severe disease hospitalization than at preventing infection. And efficacy, you know, has noticeably waned within three to four months. Um, it's probably at peak effectiveness somewhere between two to four or five weeks after the booster. Um, so uh, what's really important is that you not assume that a recent booster will keep you from catching COVID. It reduces your risk of catching COVID. So it does have like an effect on um, not catching COVID, but that effect is probably relatively small. So for instance, uh, in the winter time, during the winter Omicron wave, there was another study out of Israel in um, healthcare workers who I think had an average age of 45 or so, and they compared the ones who had the booster to the ones who didn't have the booster. And uh, I think there was like 25% of unboosted people who caught Omicron and 20% of the boosted ones who caught it. So, you know, there's a difference, but it's small. It makes a difference for a society in terms of slowing down the transmission a little bit, but for your personal protection. And I say this because I, uh, I have people who are not wearing masks on planes or other things like that. And who tell me, oh, you know, when I ask them if they're worried about catching COVID, well, you know, I'm, I'm boosted, you know, or you don't have to worry about catching it from me, I'm boosted. I had somebody say that to me, <laughs> you know, when, uh, when I asked about it. And, and I thought, well, you know, you're being boosted is great for keeping out of the hospital, but does not leave me feeling reassured about sharing my airspace with you not wearing your mask on. Um, so that's why I want to clarify that. 
Okay, so the latest booster recommendations. The CDC currently recommends a first booster for all adults. Uh, they actually also recommend it for children, but I'm not gonna get into the data on children right now. Uh, and then they recommend a second booster for adults who are age 50 plus or who are immunocompromised or high risk if it's been at least four months after the prior booster. So uh, remember that um, that second booster, the, the older you are or the otherwise higher your risk of underlying severe COVID. And for most people, age is advanced age, especially once you get into your late 70s, 80s, 90s is going to be the biggie, uh, the more valuable that additional booster is. So we know that a lot of older adults have either not had a first booster or not had a second booster. And um, I want to encourage people to get the booster. Now, what about the fall booster? So in late June, the FDA recommended a fall booster, including newer... Um, uh, they recommended that the fall booster include newer Omicron types um, so that they uh, sort of have it um, kind of the way they do the flu vaccine. They put in multiple strains that they should add in a strain of Omicron. And now the question is going to be which one? Um, probably it'll be BA5. Um, so it's not yet clear when these will be available. The manufacturers are working on it. I think they had originally worked on an Omicron booster that was more based on the first version of Omicron, now they're trying to get, you know, a more updated version of Omicron. They'll need to submit their data. So the White House COVID coordinator has said they hope to start the fall boosters by October or November, and hopefully that will happen. Now, another question I often get is what about the timing of this second booster? So I would say if you're a high risk, so again, 80 years or older, frail, chronic health problems, you know, have been hospitalized in the past year or two, uh, I don't recommend trying to time it. I would say just get it if you haven't gotten it already. But if you are not high risk, uh, the maximum protection is probably two to four weeks after the booster. Um, so there were some people earlier this spring who kind of waited till summertime when they wanted to travel. I think that's not unreasonable. Uh, we are now four months away from October, November. So I would say if you're going to get a second booster, you can do it now. Uh, or you could wait till the fall. and. Um, and again, you know, uh, to reduce catching COVID and transmitting it, I don't think vaccines are the way to go. I think taking precautions are the way to go. And you can, you can do that right now. So, um, and I will talk more about those precautions in a moment. Now, what about hybrid immunity? So hybrid immunity means you've both had COVID and been vaccinated. Uh, either you had COVID before you got vaccinated or what's fairly common is that people were vaccinated and had what used to be called a breakthrough infection. Um, those have become super, super common. So uh, experts, um, many experts consider getting COVID equivalent to getting a vaccine dose, right? It stimulates your immune system, unless you have a super mild case. It probably stimulates it in a way that's a little bit more broad and diverse than the vaccine by itself. Um, so some people used to say that if you like had had COVID, you didn't need the booster. However, the CDC's booster recommendations are the same whether or not you've had prior COVID. And so, especially if you're high risk, I wouldn't go thinking about, have you had COVID before or not? I'd probably just get the booster. Um, if you're lower risk or younger, um, then yes, that's something you could potentially keep in mind. Uh, lastly, um, just will mention that um, we do have a new COVID vaccine available as of this summer, the Novavax COVID vaccine. It uses older protein-based vaccine technology, including COVID spike proteins and an adjuvant. It's basically designed the way we've made older vaccines. Um, so the newer vaccines contain instructions to get your own body to create the viral um, RNA. Um, and, uh, and this one just gives you a piece of the spike protein for your immune system to react against and includes an adjuvant, which is like an extra kind of stimulant slash irritant for the immune system. Um, there's a type of flu vaccine for older adults that also includes an adjuvant. So it's a, it's a known method. Um, and the clinical trial data um, was gathered before Omicron. So nobody's quite sure how well it would work against Omicron. It did reasonably well. Um, I think it was tested against more like alpha and beta. So um, I don't know how many people in the United States will want it. If, you know, for those people who are worried about the new messenger RNA technology or things like that could be an option. I don't think this is gonna be a game-changing vaccine. So what is next? Um, so um, I've heard 
experts in immunology and vaccine development say that repeat boosting with the original vaccine is probably not something that we can continue for years and years. Uh, so first we're gonna transition to, you know, variant specific vaccine, but that also, I don't know that it's gonna be like a game changer uh, in terms of changing how we interact with COVID. So um, what uh, many experts think is more promising are vaccines that are better at preventing transmission, such as nasal or oral vaccines, because those get right in the layer that block um, the virus from entering. So those could actually significantly cut down transmission. Uh, which would be exciting. So they are being developed um, just not as quickly as the first round of vaccines because there's not the same amount of attention and funding, but uh, that's promising and I hope to see that effort continue. So the bottom line regarding vaccination is that vaccination remains a very good way to protect from severe COVID, but it's not a good way to protect from catching it or transmitting it. And then older adults do need boosters to maintain strong protection against hospitalization, especially for those who are age 80 or older, have chronic illnesses, or are otherwise at high risk. So beyond vaccination, how um, can we take precautions to reduce COVID transmissions? So um, I'll spend a little less time on this uh, section. Um, because this is things I've said in prior uh, updates. So the fundamentals of COVID transmission have not changed. It's mostly airborne. Uh, it's just that now you can breathe in even less of it and catch it. And the precautions means doing things that help you avoid breathing in what others have exhaled, especially if those people around you are likely, you know, if it's likely that some people around you have COVID. And when cases are high, it's, it's likely that someone in the room with you does have COVID. So it's things like minimizing time indoors where others have been exhaling. So I say that because it's not just if people are around, you know, think of it also when you go into bathrooms, elevators, you know, think of it like cigarette smoke that lingers, right? The person may have gone, but what they exhaled is often still there. Um, it is, I think, necessary to wear a much better mask now than a year ago. So an N95 or equivalent when you're indoors and ventilating those indoor spaces as much as you can. Uh, because what's changed about COVID this past year is that it's more transmissible and better able to work around the antibodies. So it takes less exposure to catch it and breakthroughs are very common. So a surgical mask or cloth mask is not adequate protection. And I recommend using an N95 or something similar. Um, and as I said, uh, those particles can linger um, in a poorly ventilated room for quite some time. So again, thinking about small enclosed spaces. Um, so good ventilation clears that out. So opening doors and windows, creating a draft, using HEPA filters. There's also a homemade air filter called a Corsi Rosenthal box that you can make or use, uh, doing things outside when possible. Um, if you're really concerned about it, you can get a carbon dioxide monitor and see sort of what the levels are. Uh, I keep hoping we'll start posting those levels in malls and public spaces the way they do in Japan. Uh, maybe, maybe not and advocating for a safe indoor air movement would help as well. Okay, and now um, a brief word about airplanes. I mentioned this last time, but I'll mention it again. Um, how safe are airplanes? They do have good air filtration, but that's provided that they are flying. Ventilation during boarding or when they're on the runway is not very good. So people who have brought carbon dioxide monitors um, on have documented that the CO2 levels can be over 3000. And again, uh, you know, normal air outside is about 450 parts per million. And the CDC has said we wanna aim for less than 800. Um, so uh, it's especially important to wear a mask during boarding and when the plane's not in flight. And then even while you're in flight, you'll be exposed to droplets and a little bit of air from the people who are sitting right next to you. Um, and in your immediate vicinity. So unless cases are very low, I would consider wearing a very good mask, um, at least during boarding. And um, honestly, I just took some long flights and I just wore um, a mask uh, the whole time. Um, and I took it off briefly to eat and drink uh, kind of during the middle of the flight. So if you want more information on uh, COVID safety in airplanes, I'll link again to this very good article from your local epidemiologist. So um, the precautions that I'm taking right now
I am wearing an N95 when I'm on planes and whenever I'm going to have prolonged indoor exposure to others. So this one looks a little bit goofy. It's the 3M V Flex, but it's really breathable. I heard about it from uh, the mask nerd, Aaron Collins. Um, and uh, N95s have loops that go around the back of your head that keeps them nice and tight on your face. I think that's actually more comfortable for a long time because it doesn't pull on your ears. Another one that I also like, it's a little less breathable, but it's the 3M Aura. Looks less goofy like that. Um, and then if I'm going to the grocery store or somewhere where I'm not going to be in there for as long, uh, I wear a KF94 like this one. Um, so these have ear loops. Um, so they're a little less sealed uh, to the face. Uh, I'm avoiding indoor dining right now. I think the key when cases are high is to be selective about when you're going to expose yourself to a lot of uh, exhalations from uh, other people. If it's for a really important event, you could do it. But um, for me, I feel like it's not that big a deal to wear uh, a mask in grocery stores or even on the plane. And then when possible, I try to socialize with people outdoors. Um, do smaller indoor gatherings and often consider, you know, we do rapid tests before we get together inside. So those are the precautions that I'm taking right now. Um, now, uh, let me briefly talk about testing and COVID today. So people sometimes wonder, do the tests still work against the current variants? And the answer is yes. Uh, the rapid tests and the PCR tests uh, still detect all variants of COVID. However, we are seeing that with Omicron, and it looks like it's the same for BA5, that people often start having symptoms, but it takes them a few days to turn positive on the rapid test. So the rapid test, again, you have to have a higher viral load in your body to turn positive on the rapid test. It's been hypothesized that people have symptoms a few days before because their immune system is revving up, uh, because they've had COVID before, they've been vaccinated. Um, how contagious are people before the rapid test is positive? Nobody knows for sure. It's safest to assume that people are contagious. So if you have had a COVID exposure or start to have symptoms that seem like they could be COVID, even if your rapid test is negative, uh, you should continue to be careful. So you can either completely isolate or you can at least wear Again, the, the best mask possible, one of these N95 things, whenever you are around uh, other people indoors and give it a few days. Um, if you're still negative on rapid tests after five days, then it's probably not COVID, it's something else. Um, and then uh, it also means that rapid testing to check for COVID before a gathering is useful, but is not necessarily foolproof. I think it still helps. You wanna do the rapid test as close to the gathering as possible. So you don't wanna do it the morning of if the gathering is in the evening. You definitely don't wanna do it the day before. Ideally within an hour before is what would be um, great. And then of course, you can sort of layer your protection by also trying to ventilate that indoor space, running an air purifier inside or opening the windows if possible. And then in terms of testing, um, so the PCR tests, the ones that are sent to the lab, they pick up smaller amounts of virus. They can remain positive for weeks. If your rapid test has um, been negative for you know, uh, ideally two days, uh, it's okay if the PCR is still positive, you're probably not contagious. So um, the experts that, uh, whose opinions I trust um, say that a positive rapid test is still considered a good way to determine if someone is contagious at the end of their COVID uh, course. Now, many people will remain positive on rapid tests for seven to 14 days. And what's safest is to assume that they're still contagious. So they should continue to isolate or if they're gonna be around other people, wear again, a good mask, not a surgical mask, not a cloth mask, but ideally an N95 because a mask is both about source control, keeping people from spreading, um, uh, air that has COVID particles into the space where others are breathing, and it helps keep you from breathing in COVID uh, as well. So they should continue to wear a mask until they test negative on rapid test. Um, so one question um, that I get asked sometimes is how long should you isolate after you get COVID? So the CDC recommendations do say five days of isolation. This is for mild COVID where you weren't uh, hospitalized. And then they recommend that people still wear a mask around others for days six through 10. 
I feel like people are often aware of the five days and maybe a little less the six to 10 um, days still wearing a very good mask. Um, again, I think the safest approach is to continue to isolate uh, or wear an excellent mask until the rapid test is negative. And um, sometimes people do a test and it's negative, but then the next day they're positive again. So it could be a false negative in part because if you just don't rub in the right spot and get enough sample, maybe um, you won't be positive. Um, so uh, what's safest is, you know, if you've had COVID, you'll have been testing positive on your rapid test, then your rapid test will become faint. It will often be faint for several days. That is still considered positive and contagious if you want to be on the safe side. And then when it's negative, you could give it another day. Uh, or if it's been strongly positive and then one day it's negative, I would definitely repeat that test the next day before assuming that you're home free. And, um, and then it's especially important to continue to monitor after you turn negative if you have taken Paxlovid. So let me now talk a little bit about Paxlovid. Uh, so by now, probably you have heard of Paxlovid. Um, it is the antiviral treatment that was developed specifically for COVID. Um, so Paxlovid reduces hospitalizations and severe outcomes in high-risk people. Uh, there is even a study, and let me take a look. Let's see if I can find it to share with everybody again. Um, here we go. So I'll post a link to this study uh, right here. Uh, there's a study showing um, that there are reduced uh, ER encounters and hospitalizations uh, after Paxlovid. So that's been really great to see um, this kind of real world evidence instead of just the clinical trial evidence. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that the clinical trial for Paxlovid, the one that allowed it to get its emergency authorization, was done in high-risk people who were unvaccinated. So Pfizer went on to uh, test Paxlovid in those they considered standard risk, so vaccinated and not at very high risk. And they actually stopped enrolling people in that trial earlier this summer because the interim results were showing that there was not a significant difference. So in people who are not at high risk, Paxlovid wasn't making a significant difference in hospitalizations, in how long they felt symptomatic, and in other um, outcomes. So I say this because although Paxlovid has been approved for people who are high risk, I see a lot of people who do not strike me as very high risk still getting it from their providers, including people who are my age with no particular health conditions. Um, and you should know that as far as we can tell, it's not particularly better for you. And there is a downside, which is the phenomenon of Paxlovid rebound. So in the original trial, Pfizer said that there were 2% of people who had a rebound, also known as a COVID relapse. So this basically means that people um, get COVID and you are supposed to take Paxlovid within the first five days. They start taking the Paxlovid, they feel better, they turn negative on rapid test, they finish the Paxlovid, and then a few days later, they start to feel sick again. Sometimes they feel even sicker than they did the first time around. And if they check the, another COVID rapid test, which they should, uh, they are positive again. And so this is the, uh, the rebound. And then they'll often be positive and feel sick for another five to eight days. Um, so Pfizer said, well, this only happened to 2% of people. There are a lot of reports of it. Actually, uh, uh, Dr. Fauci <laughs> had Paxlovid rebound. So now we have President Biden who uh, just tested positive for COVID, apparently is feeling pretty well. He's on Paxlovid and I hope he won't get a rebound. Um, but um, one uh, expert polled his followers on Twitter and 40% or 45% of people said they had experienced rebound. So my guess is that it's probably 10 to 20% of people who are going to have um, a rebound. Um, so this is another reason why I think you should be careful about taking Paxlovid if you're not at high risk. But I totally recommend Paxlovid for um, people who are older, have chronic conditions, or otherwise are at high risk, even if they're vaccinated. It's just important to look out for the rebound, to be aware of it, and to have a very low threshold to test again if you start feeling unwell a few days after finishing the Paxlovid. And then if you get the rebound, it's real. It's COVID virus uh, in your body. You should consider yourself contagious, and you should isolate 
and mask going around other people until your rapid test turns negative again. A uh, quick word for the immunocompromised. Um, so uh, I mentioned last time that Evusheld is a special prophylactic antibody treatment. Now it's interesting with Omicron BA5, a lot of the monoclonal antibody treatments that we used to use before, um, look, it looks like they're not effective. In lab testing, they're not very effective except just one, uh, which starts with a B, betelvomab. I'm saying it wrong, but I'll post it in um, the, uh, the links. Um, now, Evusheld was a special antibody treatment that was designed not to be given when people are sick from COVID, but to be given as prophylaxis for people who are immune compromised. It's engineered, so it lasts much longer in the body. They have tested in the lab Evusheld against BA5, and it does retain some protective activity as best they can tell. So uh, if you have received Evusheld, that's reassuring. I still recommend taking some sensible precautions during this time of high cases, but there it is. Uh, if you haven't had it yet, but you are immune compromised, it's not too late to request it. And I would uh, recommend it. So in short, uh, if you wanna be safer from COVID, and again, I think it's worth, I think it's worth trying. We don't wanna ruin our summers. We don't wanna ruin our lives, but I think um, for those of us who are younger, healthier, it's about not playing Russian roulette with your health and running the risk of long COVID or there are potentially other um, increases in chronic diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease after COVID. The research on that keeps changing because now people are vaccinated, people have immunity, the variants are different, but um, I still think when you're younger, catching COVID is a little bit playing Russian roulette. You'll probably be fine, but you never know. And then of course, um, taking precautions is a way to reduce transmission and protect those who are more vulnerable. Uh, around us. And then if you are older uh, or at risk, I think it's worth taking precautions as well. So um, rates are high in most of the United States, <laughs> but you can keep an eye on that and hopefully you'll see them coming down where you are soon. You can follow wastewater, uh, local COVID dashboards, or you can check on Walgreens for your state um, and see, and then be vaccinated, stay up to date, make sure you've had that third dose. Older adults and those at risk should definitely get a fourth dose uh, as well. And always remember that COVID's airborne. Um, so ventilation, careful around crowds, best mask possible, you know, N95 um, if possible when indoors, when on planes, uh, especially when boarding. And then I hope that we can continue as a society to support safer indoor air, to continue funding for COVID monitoring, um, to continue the work on the development of the next generation of vaccines, which hopefully will reduce the transmission. So um, stay safe, be well, enjoy your summer. Just take a few precautions. Thank you so much for watching this COVID update. And I'll be back once there are more major developments later this year. Bye.